So Adam, you play the villain, Kylo Ren. How did you feel about taking on the role of the villain? Well, I didn't think of him as a villain. I, I guess when we were working on it, I tried to, through JJ, kind of hearing what he had to say about him, uh, tried to hopefully make him as human as possible. And so that's where I started, uh, I guess, where we started as opposed to an end result. We tried to think of how, how that person began. Kylo Ren is a complex and conflicted, conflicted villain who wears a mask. How did you approach showing all of these dimensions without the aid of facial emotions? Well, some of it, I guess, is not really up to me, and some of it was. I feel, you know, it's so collaborative that I can, you, know, you can only do so much and just trust everyone that, that, um, that the story is coming across, that you don't, um, maybe you don't fight the costume, I guess. There's so many trusting that the power of thought is, is um, I, is a powerful force to, uh, to use uh, vernacular from the movie. The, the costume is powerful, but also, also like just getting it on is a lot of information. And then why, why does that person feel the need to cover themselves or be concealed is also a lot of information, you know. And then trusting the power of thought, I guess, that, that all that, that story is still coming across even though you can't be seen. Right. What was it like working with J.J. on fleshing out the character? Very exciting. He, he's... Mm -hmm. um, couldn't be a more calm, you know, thoughtful collaborator who, I mean, that sounds like a line, but it's, it's true. I've been in like, uh, his ability to kind of compartmentalize and, and give everyone their, you know, due attention and, and with the, still keeping a third eye on, on the bigger picture is pretty incredible to witness. Yeah. Were you impressed by the scale of the film and the practical sets and how did that sense of reality and authenticity help you as an actor? Well, just speaking of JJ, he just he understood that innately that, that uh, putting people in front of you know blue walls wasn't it wouldn't be as exciting as putting people in front of like you know tactile objects and how that also gave him room to, for improv, which was really I think necessary in something like this. And I feel like you get that in the original trilogy that even though it's um, they they were working within constraints, you know, either either financial or you know just technology, and I think uh, allowed them for a lot of improv, and he set himself up for that, and with having, uh, you know, probably more resources, but still giving himself uh, constraints, which is which is good. What kind of training did you have to do for this part? Uh, a lot of fight training, a lot of uh, which was which was fine. I mean, these people are at, at war, so it's they they are very physical anyway, you know, and that that kind of all informs everyone's character, I'd say. What can audiences look forward to when Star Wars: The Force Awakens hits the big screen? I don't know. I feel like that's a question for them to answer. What I feel like everyone, the strength of these movies that they create so many worlds and there's, there's so much detail in them that people kind of. I hesitate to say what people are gonna feel when they go in and watch the movie, but um, I think that they'll uh, hopefully find uh, themselves immersed, immersed in a world that they can take ownership of. Great. If you had to s describe your experience making this film in one word, what would that word be and why? Surreal. Self-explanatory. Yes. <laughs> so you play Poe Dameron, a resistance pilot. Why is this character a perfect role for you and how did you make it your own? Well, uh, I, I really love the conflict that he has. He's, he's someone that comes from a long line of rebel fighters. He believes in the force. He's committed to the resistance and fighting the First Order. Uh, he's also has a bit of a problem with authority, uh, a little bit reckless. He's got a, he's, he's got a bit of a, a wise cracking <laughs> mouth that gets him into some trouble now and then. Uh, and, and for me, it was a very fun character to play, especially the idea of injecting humor. And JJ, in, in a real spirit of collaboration, uh, was open to ideas and, and even improvising lines here and there and dialogue. And, and I think that's what makes this, this, uh, this newest chapter in the, in the saga so fresh, is that there's a bit of a messiness and a wildness to it uh, and, and a real uh, sense of humor to the whole thing. Is there any part of Poe that is like you or that you would like to be? Uh, well, all, all of it's like me. I think every character that I play, uh, really for, for me, the job of the actor is an investigation into the self 
and the work that the actor does is is the is kind of the fruits of that investigation. Uh, so for me, it's about well, what would it be like to want to have something to prove like that, to prove your worth and prove your goodness, and and also to uh, to do that, to fly above everybody else at incredible speeds, to have a mind that can work that fast. And I imagine the feeling of invincibility and the feeling of, of immortality and how that would affect my personality. And so you know, that's kind of where I start from. Uh, we hear you come from a family of avid Star Wars fans. How did they react when you told them you got a part in Star Wars The Force Awakens? Uh, there was a lot of near fainting. There was a lot of people turning green, <laughs> and uh, and they just they, they couldn't believe it. They were thrilled, and they came to visit me on set. and And JJ even ended up uh, uh, putting my uncle, who was the biggest out of all of us uh, fan, uh, in, into the film as an extra, which was just uh, was the pinnacle moment in his life. That's awesome. Uh, what was your reaction when you saw that the filmmakers actually built an X-Wing for you? What impressed you most about all the practical sets and vehicles? Well, I, I, when I walked on the set and saw the real life-sized X-Wing that, and when I walked up to it, opened up automatically and I would jump in and it would close and the lights would fire up and the sounds of the engine could come up and you had the little BB-8 behind there turning its head. It was like a dream. I, it was hard to imagine. Uh, and having all those things on set was, was just, uh, it, it felt authentic. It felt real. We didn't feel like we were pretending. And I'll, I'll, of course, also having the original cast there, having uh, Harrison and, and, and Carrie, and then you'd see Chewbacca and Anthony Daniels. You know, it really it felt authentic. That's awesome. Your character has a new droid, BB-8. Is he a scene stealer? And how do you think audiences will like him? I think BB-8 might, might steal the whole movie. Uh, it's BB-8 is a very special little droid with its own personality. And I think the thing to remember with Star Wars is that every time a new movie comes out, uh, along with the film comes some sort of advancement in technology. Uh, and uh, the engineering of BB-8 is a perfect example of that. Uh, it's, it's like magic the way that they put that, that little droid together. And again, that's another practical set. It's a real a droid that can roll around and, and do do what it does. So, uh, I think that's one of the another one of the real really special things about Star Wars. How was it working with J.J. Abrams for the first time? Pretty shitty. <laughs> Pretty shitty. Uh, no, working with J.J. Abrams, uh, he infused everyone with such enthusiasm and such joy uh, that it was it was really a process of of, of trusting him completely. And, and letting that feeling take over. You know, it, it's really about connecting to that childhood thing, uh, the, the wonder and the excitement. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, he was just amazing uh, as far as, as, uh, as infusing everything with, with joy. How did it feel to be back on a Star Wars set after 30 years? You know, it, it, it might have felt silly uh, to be, uh, um, going back and playing a character that you played uh, 40 years ago. Um, but it didn't. And it didn't because um, there was a clear job to be done. There was an extension of the character that I thought was interesting and would take uh, the audience to a new place. There was a um, development in the character that's ref that doesn't play out on screen, but is referred to in a way that the audience understands the circumstances that have uh, been part of Han's history um, between the last uh, of the first three and the events that we're following in this one. And, and those circumstances in his life have created um, uh, changes uh, which are going to motivate him in different ways than we might expect. So the character has some surprise to him at this point. Tell us about the Millennium Falcon. Is it the same as you left it? Uh, the Millennium Falcon, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's funny because the, the set had actually been dismantled after the first film. 
it had not been predicted that the film would be such a success as it was. And so that it, uh, they had to um, recreate it um, from, you know, um, from uh, pictures. Um, and they did a, a beautiful job of, of rebuilding it and it was uh, very, it was indistinguishable uh, to me from the original uh, set. Um, so it was, uh, it was nice to be back. This is the first time you've worked with J.J. Abrams as a director. What is his style and what does he bring to the filmmaking process? His style is, uh, you know, intense preparation, um, great enthusiasm, uh, willingness, and gives himself uh, both, uh, it gives himself the freedom uh, to make changes in his expectations according to what he sees on, on, on the set. He's collaborative. He's, uh, uh, he is altogether a uh, consummate uh, master of his craft. Last question, what do you think of the newcomers to the franchise, John Boyega and Daisy Ridley? Uh, I think I think the choices that were made in, to cast these parts are are wonderful uh, choices. Daisy and John are wonderful in their parts. They're very interesting people, both of them, and I think they're going to have an a unbelievable future.